Hello there, my name is Amit Power and I am going to be talking to you today about whether Dr. Google can teach us regional anesthesia. Now, this is an, a talk I was invited to give by Dr. Tanya Selak uh, at the ANSCA ASM for 2023 that was held in Sydney and I delivered this talk virtually. So let's get into it. The first thing to say is I do have some disclosures, none of which will impact my ability to deliver this talk but two of them are relevant. I do have my own podcast and my own YouTube channel. Now, the first thing I thought when I was going to be delivering this talk was, why don't I ask ChatGPT what it thinks about whether you can learn regional anesthesia for Google? So that's exactly what I did. Um, and when I asked the question, I actually got a really sensible answer, which is don't rely solely on Google for this information because regional anesthesia is a complex procedure involving an understanding of anatomy, pharmacology, and physiology. So essentially the disclaimer is you've got to have some knowledge and skills and experience first. And in theory, that could be the end of the talk. But it wouldn't be fun if I left it there. So let's go into a bit more detail. So I want you to imagine that we're looking at this question through the eyes of Dr. Tanya. Now, Dr. Tanya is learning regional anesthesia for the first time. And what might she do if she were to search Google for regional anesthesia? So let's imagine she types in how do I do an interscaling block into a Google search window. So when she does that, what happens? Well, what that will do is that will pull up, pull up some websites, videos, images, and some books. So let's look at these in a bit more detail. Um, the websites and images are likely to come from sources such as educational sources, like such as the NYSORA, the New York School of Regional Anesthesia, or Azra.ca, Ultrasound Regional Anesthesia from Canada. Uh, you might get YouTube channels. Uh, you might get national regional anesthesia societies, such as RAUK or the American Society of Regional Anesthesia. You may even get personal websites, and you may get links to journals. Well, what about videos? If you click on videos, it's likely to take you straight to YouTube, and there'll be society videos, uh, company videos, that's, that's uh, ultrasound manufacturers, for example, or maybe people's personal YouTube channels. It may even link you to videos on Twitter or LinkedIn, or even TikTok and Instagram. So when we're talking about all of these social media um, apps that are out there, how big is the social media market? Well, I was actually blown away when I had a look at this. Um, so MAU is monthly active users. And look at this, Facebook has 2.9 billion monthly active users, closely followed by YouTube, then WhatsApp, Instagram, and then there's a whole host of other um, apps that I haven't come across. They're mainly based in China. Um, but this gives you an idea of all of those different social media apps that are out there and just how frequently people use them. I'm not going to focus on all of these. I'm going to focus on the ones that I tend to use the most, and I think most people do. So YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Now, when you've got all of these, uh, these social media apps there, the question is, how do you know which ones you can trust? Who do you trust? So let's go into one of them. Where are we going to start? Let's start off by looking at YouTube. So YouTube is the largest online video sharing platform. It's the second largest search engine. You can probably guess what the first uh, largest search engine is. It's the second most visited website in the world and has 1.3 billion videos uploaded and 5 billion videos are watched per day. That's pretty impressive. Now, the most popular video has 12 billion views. I wonder if you have any idea what that video would be. I'd love it to be one of my regional anesthesia videos, but it is, in fact, Baby Shark. Baby Shark has got 12 billion views. So that's pretty incredible. Now, regional anesthesia is really suited to what I call viducation because you can see dynamic pro position, you can work out how they're generating an image, you can see the anatomy and the sonoanatomy, and also you can see the needle visualization in real time. The other thing is it's available 24 seven, you can access it via phone, from a laptop, or from a tablet, and it's perfect for just-in-time learning. And actually, if you look on the right-hand side here, this is one of my fellows who I was talking to uh, about a nerve block procedure, and whilst I was talking to her, she started doing something on her telephone and she picked up a video of the actual technique I was talking about. And in fact, it's a video of me demonstrating something on myself. So just I was, as I was talking to her about a technique, she was able to search the internet and find a video describing exactly what I was talking about. Um, there is a but. And the but is when you're using YouTube, 
and there is no quality control or content verification and there's no peer review. So how do you know which, uh, which YouTube channels to trust? Is there a minimum content that you need to be searching for when you're looking for regional anesthesia videos? Because there is a risk of shallow learning. If, if all you learn is what's presented, that's all you're going to learn. You're not going to learn any deeper. And of course, the top videos on YouTube are not necessarily selected by quality. They're selected by the number of views or number of hits that they get. So people have actually looked at how YouTube can be used for learning regional anesthesia. And I've picked three such relatively recent examples. And if you scan the QR code, you'll be taken to each of those papers. So let's look in summary at what some of these papers said. So the first thing this, uh, this particular paper did was it took some reference material. So in blue shown here are the New York Society of Regional Anesthesia, the American College of Emergency Physicians, and the azra.ca website. And they used these as their reference websites that they thought provided the most comprehensive ultrasound education for regional anesthesia. And they marked all of these different sources against different categories, such as indications for block, um, the transducer position, the goal, local anesthetic volumes, etc. And not surprisingly, the reference uh, websites did very well. They scored highly. And when they looked at YouTube as, as a whole, across all of these categories, you'll see there's a variation in performance. So not all of the YouTube videos dealt with all of those categories. Then they decided to hone down a little bit more. So they decided to look according to each block. So they picked interscaling, supraclavicular, infraclavicular, axillary, femoral, popliteal, and tap blocks. So they looked across those blocks and they said what percentage of those educational categories in the previous slide were dealt with in these videos. And as you can see, um, NYSORA, the American College of Emergency Physicians and Azra.ca did very well, nearly 100% across all of those categories, was when they looked at YouTube for those videos, uh, for those top videos, they didn't score quite as highly. One of the other papers decided to produce a heat map for YouTube video quality, and they broke it down to interscaling, supraclavicular, infraclavicular, and auxiliary videos here. So they looked at a number of these videos for each of these blocks, and again marked them against 18 educational categories. And if they scored highly, the, the color on the map would be dark, would be blue. But as you can see, many of the videos are scoring light colors. They got low scores. So actually, there's a big variation in the quality of the videos. So what are the common themes? There were some excellent videos on YouTube, but the, the quality varied. And um, what they noticed was videos that came from academic centers, from manufacturers or educational websites, they had the best quality videos. If the videos were too short, they often missed out on some detail. And all, even some of the top viewed videos missed some aspects. And what they suggested that maybe having some form of rating system may help. And maybe what we should be doing is establish a minimum content for videos and create these virtual libraries or hubs where we direct learners to, uh, to, to vetted videos. So actually, one of the, uh, the companies or one of the groups that have curated a list of valuable resources are ASRA, the American Society of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine. And they've actually created this area called the ASRA Pain Medicine Best, where they looked at areas in acute pain, POCUS, point of care, ultrasound that is, and chronic pain. And they've used their uh, assessment uh, rubric, which happens to spell out pain, looking at production value or creativity, accuracy, foundational information and non-commercially biased components. Well, on the basis of that, and that QR code will take you to their website, they've managed to secure some decent, a, a resource where people can go and actually get good quality videos. And they also suggested in, this, in these papers that we should direct learners to content. So I'm going to do just that for you now. Um, if you look, these are YouTube channels that I have used often, the New York uh, School of Regional Anesthesia, RA UK, Duke, which is mainly all due to the work of Dr. Jeff Gasden, Ki Jin Chin, and Vicente Roquez. These are excellent YouTube channels with great resources, slightly different styles with how they're presented, and they all are of great value. So, what about Twitter, which of course came about in 2006? So, Twitter has a microblog character limit now set at 280 characters. And it actually has the ability to impact article citations and impact factors of journals. Um, so we've actually seen that there can be a correlation with the number of 
tweets that a, uh, that a paper may get, and that may then go on to affect how many times an article is cited, and ultimately how uh, what a journal's impact factor is, which is pretty incredible, actually. And it's also a useful way of disseminating research. You get a paper published, you tweet it, and you automatically direct your audience or your followers to that content. Um, and who can you follow on Twitter? You can follow journals, you can uh, follow societies, and people that are considered to be influencers, i.e. they have a large following and they can spread knowledge and information. The other great thing about Twitter is the hashtag filing system, as I like to call it. So any tweet that is associated with a particular hashtag, you can then, at any time in the future, search for that hashtag and find any tweets that are being tagged with that particular ha hashtag. So why might Twitter be useful for regional anesthesia? Well, actually, it's really great because you can put video content up, and this is a tweet I put out a while ago showing uh, an erector spiny plane block being performed and then a catheter being threaded in real time and then visualization of the catheter afterwards. So it's quite useful to be able to get information and videos out there. We can also use Twitter as a medium for getting engagement for conferences. So this is um, from a virtual conference we had, Regional Anesthesia uh, UK 21. And actually, look at that, 18.68 million impressions. That's the number of times those tweets from that conference with that hashtag appeared on people's timelines. So you can suddenly, from what is um, maybe a conference that's limited to those people to, that subscribe to it, you can suddenly massively increase the reach. The other pe thing people use Twitter for is, um, is for journal clubs, and these can be journal clubs that can be held in person but also shared via Twitter. Uh, and this one particular example is the guys at Duke use the NSJC uh, hashtag to do real-time journal club, and they invite discussions from people on Twitter in real time. And you can obviously uh, answer those questions at any time you want, but it's a good way of getting people involved in educational material. I can't talk about Twitter and regional anesthesia and not talk about Blocktober. For those of you who are not familiar with it, Blocktober uh, is the brainchild of a colleague of mine, a friend of mine called Jeff Gadsden. He decided one year that every day for the month of October he was going to release educational tips and tricks and videos for the whole month of October. He called it Blocktober and it's now become something that, that regional anesthetists look forward to every year. Because you know when, block, uh, when October comes around, you're going to get new content. There are some negatives with Twitter, however, so let's get into those. Um, there is the potential for a hype factor. So people who have influence, who have a following, can start talking about something that maybe wouldn't have gained traction otherwise. And as a result, um, lots of people find out about it. So this is a perfect example. So the erector spiny plane block gained a lot of traction, a lot of excitement. Um, and there are some people, if I zoom in, you may recognize one of the names there. There are some people that are responsible for a lot of the tweets about the erector spiny plane block. So just because people are talking about it doesn't necessarily mean it's validated or it's good or effective, but it's just a way of reaching an audience. Of course, the character limit in Twitter means that maybe people are curating or truncating some of the information they want to discuss and you don't get the full story. The other thing is there's a potential for it to be an echo chamber. You only follow people that are interested in what you're talking about um, or people with the loudest voice are heard and there's aspects of self-promotion. So sometimes when people are sharing things on Twitter, they may be an ulterior motive. So you've got to be aware of that. And followed on from that, there is no peer review or content checking. In the past, you used to be able to get a blue tick by, by jumping through certain hurdles and making sure that you had a clean Twitter record, you had a website, you were tweeting the right amount, right type of content, as now that blue tick is a purchasable asset. So you can pay money for a subscription in order to get your tweets pushed to the top of other people's timelines. That doesn't necessarily recommend or represent, sorry, um, the quality of what you're tweeting about. If you do get very much into Twitter, there's a potential for uh, spending a little bit too much time on there and there are potential mental health uh, impacts of you spending too much time on your phone and there are um, you hear reports about it all the time about cyber bullying or microaggressions people saying things or ganging up on you on Twitter so that's something to be aware of but nevertheless it is the platform I use a lot so if you were going to use Twitter how should you start well I would think you start off following a few people or a few tweets and following a few hashtags. So what hashtags would you follow? Well, regional anesthesia, spelt the uh, British way and the American way is a good place to start. 
also in October. Follow the hashtag Blocktober. You can search for that now and you'll see all of the past content. Um, and here's a few examples of some of the videos that are out there already. You can follow some societies. So Regent Anesthesia UK, of which I was a former board member. The American and European societies are a couple of examples. You can follow some journals. Regent Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, the Anesthesia Journal and BJA Journals are now all starting to publish some decent quality Regional Anesthesia content. And of course they publish some of that content ahead of time on Twitter so you'll know they're coming out. The other thing you can do is follow a group of people and I've just selected a lots of people that I would recommend you follow on Twitter but I've just highlighted a few people here that are worthwhile following because I know that they, um, they circulate and share some good quality information. One to watch is Mick Kerr from Australia, who's actually started to produce some really great quality uh, regional anesthesia content, which he shares via uh, Twitter, but also puts out on his YouTube channel. Okay, so that's Twitter. What about the blingy version now? What about Instagram and TikTok? So these are uh, image and video sharing platforms. They generally have uh, very short duration videos, um, and they're probably an atypical platform for learning. I would say um, be careful if you're going to venture onto these uh, these apps because they can be addictive. And there are many people that are, call themselves doctors or uh, that produce medical content, but you can't always uh, trust what you get exposed to. So there's no research on using Instagram or, uh, or TikTok uh, for regional anesthesia, and it may not be the platform for all, but there is some good regional anesthesia content. So I'd like to point out a couple. So on Instagram, uh, there's someone called Blocker Girl, Sarah Amaral, and she puts some really useful educational content. So with each Instagram post, she has a number of images and a number of videos um, with some great educational content. The only thing is, it is in Portuguese, um, and, but there are some English uh, videos in there, and a lot of the times you can work out what's going on. But that's an example of someone who's using Instagram for really great reasons. And then what about TikTok? Well... I have a colleague on TikTok called Melody Herman, Dr. Melody Herman, and she's got some really great stuff. The beam from the ultrasound is about the width of a credit card, and it's right in the center of the probe. Make sure that my needle is lined up exactly under the center of that beam before I insert into skin. So you can get an example here of what Melody is doing. This is a basic video, but she's actually shared some really quite interesting block technique using TikTok as a platform. So if you wanted to start to see um, what useful regional anesthesia content is out there, I would recommend you give her a follow. Now, what about journals? Because of course, this is the, the background picture represents what happens to most of the physical journals in my house. It's, in fact, in most of the cases, I don't actually get to open them from the cellophane or the plastic wrapping. So when we talk about journals, we've of course got physical journals, and I've alluded to the issues with those in the past. Where do you store them? Once you've got them, how do you find a potential article? And there's of course the environmental impact. Now electronic journals can sometimes be hidden behind paywalls. So you want to get a particular article, you've got to pay money for it. Which electronic journals do you access? Um, how do you filter which ones are good? How do you get the good regional anesthesia content out there? It is possible, actually, that review articles for regional anaesthesia are better than books. Um, so if you were going to start using journals as a reference for regional anaesthesia, um, where should you start? What, can, you know, what should you type into Google? Well, if you type into Google essentials of our current understanding in the regional anaesthesia and pain medicine section, you'll get uh, directed to some really great educational content. This particular search strategy will take you to some upper limb, lower limb, brachial plexus and some abdominal wall block uh, review articles which are really thorough, they're really in depth and I think should be, some, should form the baseline of your kind of journal content and you know probably replace textbooks for much of that. BJA Education also, also have a curated regional anaesthesia collection um, that's constantly being updated so that's a good source. An anaesthesia journal also have a special regional anaesthesia collection so Using those three journals as examples, you can go to those journals and search for those particular areas. Um, what about websites? Now, there are a lot of potential websites out there. The question is, do you want to pay money for a website to get some content which may or may not be good, or should you just rely on the freely open access available websites? And I think, actually, this level of education should be free. 
there are some online textbooks that are available out there, um, but actually some of these websites are acting like living textbooks because the content is so good. They often have images and videos as part of that. And some of these websites even have an assessment or a simulation component. Um, the websites I've used in the past are national society websites, educational websites, and some people have got personal websites. But are they peer reviewed? And they're not clearly. How do you know which ones to trust? What I'm going to do is I'm going to direct you to some websites that I've used in the past. So again, here are these websites associated with the QR code. So the Azra.ca, it's a Canadian region anesthesia website, really fantastic. Nysora.com has got some great free uh, um, resources. There is a paid component as well, but there's freely available information, which is really great. Azra is a great resource, and it, again, it will direct you, direct you to certain regional anesthesia articles that are freely available, uh, as well as the um, uh, WFSAHQ.org uh, website. Uh, and then REUK has got the Plan A blocks freely accessible to all, and Euraxium.com. Euraxium.com is one of the first websites I used when I started doing my regional anesthesia training. And it's great because they've got uh, ultrasound images, and if you hover the mouse over it, it will give you the ana um, anatomical overlay. You'll see the, the the drawings come over the ultrasound image, so you can make sense of what you're looking at. And they even have some simulation practice, so you can say, well, I'll put my needle there. Is that the right place? And you can work out if you're right or wrong. So these QR codes will take you to each of those um, respective websites, and I recommend you give those a look. What about podcasts? So um, these are now becoming more and more popular, mainly because they're uh, smartphone accessible. And I think this is a new way of learning regional anesthesia that taps into um, a resource that probably we haven't used before. Um, it's a great way to augment learning, and you can use it as background education. You can be doing another activity whilst you're listening to this, so traveling to work or doing, some, do some, doing something at home and having this in the background. It's a great way to learn. Some journals are using podcasts as a way of having more in-depth discussions about articles with the, um, with the authors. And it can be like a conversational style discussion. And you can review podcasts multiple times. So if you, if you miss something, go back and listen to it again or listen to the same podcast a number of times. And these are often free, but they are opinion-based. Um, and um, they're not really undergoing any peer review unless you know they're journal ones. But again, that's still the author's opinion. So do I have any recommendations? Well, I said I had a conflict of interest. And of course, I spent some time with a good friend of mine recording my own podcast. Uh, it's called Block It Like It's Hot. And it was my colleague, Dr. Jeff Gadsden from Duke in North Carolina. So uh, those three QR codes will take you through to Spotify, to Apple Podcasts, or to the podcast website. So please do check it out. So back to the question. Can Dr. Google teach us regional anesthesia? Well, let's go and visit Dr. Tanya. So now Dr. Tanya remembered that the next day she's going to be working with Dr. Marianne. And Dr. Marianne told her that we're going to be doing some nerve blocks. So she thinks, gosh, I better do some work. She gets her textbooks out. She starts reading them. But then she remembered she'd been having a play with some phantoms. And she got pretty good at doing some needling on phantoms. She thought, you know what, let me carefully place those textbooks to one side. I'll get onto the internet and I'll search the um, regional anesthesia and pain medicine videos from Duke about interscaling brachial plexus block, and she revises the technique. The next morning, she makes her way into work. She gets onto the underground and she pops on her uh, headphones and she watches another YouTube video. This time, she watches one of mine, still on the interscaling nerve block, but in different educational components. And when she's done that, she then listens to a podcast to augment her learning. She then arrives uh, at work the next day, goes into hospital, meets Dr. Marianne, and gets on and does the block. So she's been able to use Google to help augment her learning on a baseline of knowledge that she'd already gained. So can Dr. Google teach us regional anesthesia? I was going to say yes, but actually I'm going to say no. Google can't teach us, but it can certainly help as part of MME. What do I mean by MME? I mean multimodal education. We've already demonstrated how textbooks and review articles may have a role, um, but Google can help us as part of that multimodal education. Make sure you use validated sources, know your anatomy and pharmacology, practice scanning and needling, and then go out there and attend workshops and courses and have a mentor. If you do all of that, 
Google can be a great way to facilitate learning, but it can't teach you everything. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed that. And if you uh, are watching this video, you're probably already watching it on my channel, so I don't need to tell you about that. Many thanks.